Welcome to Shonama, Book of Kings. Today we continue with Kesra Nushin Ravine's reign. King Kesra Nushin Ravine, some a describe, talked at length about the Emperor of China, and then dictated an answer to the Emperor's letter. He began with praise of God who is victorious and who re maintains the world, who is our guide to good and evil, who raises whomever he wishes from misery to the high heavens, while another man lives in wretchedness because God does not desire his prosperity. The letter continued, I am grateful to him for all benefits, and if I do evil, it is his wrath that I fear. May my soul be divided from my body if my hope and fear turn away from him. The envoy bearing the Emperor of China's kind message arrived here, and I heard all he had to say concerning a marriage and the Emperor's daughters, who live secluded in his palace. I will be happy to become allied to you, especially if it is by marrying your veiled daughter. To this end, I am sending you a wise ambassador, and when he arrives, he can tell you of my secret thoughts about his alliance. May your soul and body always be filled with sobriety. May your heart be happy, and your friendship toward us continue. When the scribe's pen ceased to move and the ink was dry, he folded the letter and sealed it with musk. Kestra gave the emperor's envoy a robe of honor, and his escort was astonished by its quality. Then he chose a wise high priest, whose name was Mehan Satid, and his companions a hundred eloquent and noble Persian horsemen. To Mehan Satid, he said, Travel with joy and victory, kindness and justice. Your thoughts and speech must be astute and eloquent, with wisdom to guide you. First examine in his harem, and see that you can accurately distinguish the women there. Don't let a well-made-up face or splendid clothes or fine jewelry deceive you. There are many young women in his private quarters, all of them tall and splendid and crowned. Someone born from a serving girl is no good to me, even if her father is the king. Look to see which of them is modest and acts appropriately. Someone whose mother is from the emperor's family, who is of true royal lineage. If she is happy in her body and as her descent, she will make the world happy and be happy herself. Mehan Satid listened to the king and called down blessings on the throne and crown. He set out on an auspicious day in the month of Kordad, and when he arrived at the Chinese court, he kissed the ground and paid homage to the emperor, who welcomed him and assigned him splendid living quarters. But the emperor was troubled, and he went to the apartments of his wife, the empress, he told her of what Nushin Ravin had said, and talked to her at length about his wealth and army. He said, This king, Nushin Ravin, is young and intelligent, and fortune smiles on him. It would be a good idea to give him a daughter as a bride. It would increase my standing with him. You and I have a daughter in Purda here, who is crown of all princesses, but I love to see her face and could not bear to be parted from her. I have four other daughters born from servant girls. I'll give him one of those, and that will save me both from war and from him and from any gossip. The emperor said, no one in the world is as cunning as you are. Having made this decision, the emperor slept until the sun rose above the mountains. Then Mahan Satid appeared before the throne and handed over Kestra's letter. When the emperor read the letter, he laughed with pleasure, both because of the alliance and because a bride was to be chosen. He gave the Persian envoy the key to his harem and said, Go and see who is hidden there. Four servants, who were in the emperor's confidence, accompanied him. The envoy took the key and entered the private apartments, while the servant told him tales of what to expect. They said, Neither the sun, nor the moon, nor any wind have ever set on eyes on those you will see. The apartments were arranged like a paradise. One that contained the sun and the moon was filled with luxury. Five young women sat there with crowns on their heads and treasures at their feet. All but the great queen's child, whose eloquence did not require such gaudy ornaments. Her dress was old and plain, her head was bare, crowned only with her coiled and musky hair, while her unpowdered and bewitching face shone with a lovely God-created grace. She seemed a cypress with the moon above, 
filling the women's rooms with light and love. Mehan Satid knew he had never seen anyone as lovely as she was, and his quick mind saw that the emperor and empress were being far from honest. The young woman covered her eyes with her hands and veil, and this increased Mehan Satid's anger at their duplicity. He said to the servants, The king has plenty of crowns, thrones, and bracelets. I choose this one, who has no crown or fine ornaments, since she is worthy to be elevated in such a fashion. I undertook the pains of this journey to make a good choice. I didn't come here for Chinese brocade. The empress said to him, Old man, you have not said one pleasing word. There are women here with plenty of splendor and beauty and good sense who delight the heart in our marriageable age, tall like cypresses with faces as lovely as springtime and who know how to serve a king. And you have chosen an immature child. This is not sensible of you. Mehan Satid replied, If the emperor had deceived me, then my king would also say I wasn't sensible. I chose this young woman who has no ivory throne, no crown or torque or jewelry. If your majesties do not approve, I shall return home as soon as I'm permitted to do so. The emperor considered his words, astonished by his understanding and by his decision. He saw that this old man's mind was clear and that he was a great personage who was fit to carry out such delicate tasks. The wise ruler sat with his advisers and emptied the court of strangers. He ordered astrologers with western charts in their hands together with the great men of the country and all who felt benevolent toward the throne to search for the will of heavens. A priest studied the stars as they affected the emperor's alliance with the king and said at last <laughs> do not trouble your heart about this matter it can only end auspiciously and will not deliver the world into your enemy's hands this is the secret of the high heavens and of the favorable stars that turn there a king who will be an ornament to the throne will be born from his this daughter of the emperor and from the king's loins princes will pay homage to him as will the noblemen of China. When they heard this, the emperor's heart rejoiced, and the splendid empress smiled with pleasure. Once their hearts were set at rest, they sent the envoy down and before them and told him what he needed to know about the empress's daughter. Mehan Satid accepted her from her father in the king's name. Servants came joyfully before the king, bringing her splendid dowry, which included gold coins, jewels, torques, crowns, turquoise seals, an ivory throne, another throne of Indian aloes wood, encrusted with gold and gems, a hundred finely saddled horses, a hundred camels laden with Chinese brocade, forty pieces of golden brocade woven with emeralds, a hundred camels laden with carpets, and three hundred servant girls. The emperor waited until the company had mounted in Chinese fashion with banners in their hands, and then he ordered that a throne covered in gold and silver cloth encrusted with gems be placed on an elephant's back. A hundred men lifted it into place, and beside it there was a banner of Chinese brocade so huge that it hid the ground. A golden litter was draped in brocade, and within it was the uncut jewel the emperor's daughter, while the three hundred beautiful servant girls accompanied her with happiness in their heart. Fifty servants and forty eunuchs formed an escort, and this was the manner in which the emperor sent his daughter to the Persian king. When this had been accomplished, a scribe came forward bearing musk, rose water, and silk, and the emperor dictated a letter of great splendor. He began with praise of the Creator, who maintains the world, who is vigilant and all-seeing, and whose creatures fulfill the destinies he appoints for them. He continued, The Persian king is like a crown to me, and my alliance with him is not simply for my daughter's sake. I have always heard from those who are wise and noble, and from priests who have insight into such matters, about his glory and greatness. And this is why I have sought to be allied with him. No ruler in all the world is as just as he is. None has his magnanimity, or 
is as victorious and powerful as he is. None has his glory and might, and his faith in God nourishes his knowledge and understanding. I have sent my child to King Kesra, according to our customs, and have told her to act as his slave, as is fitting when she is his women's quarters, to imbibe wisdom from his glory, and to learn his court ceremonies and manners. May good fortune and wisdom guide you, and may greatness and knowledge be your support. They set a seal of Chinese musk on the letter, when the emperor gave to the envoy and called down blessings on him. Then he gave Mehan Satid a robe of honor, more splendid than any given before by a king to a messenger. He also delighted Mehan Satid's companions with presents of gold coins and musk. He traveled with his daughter and her wealth, the cavalry and richly caparisoned elephants, as far as the shore of the river Oxus. And there heartfelt tears fell from their eyes. He waited until they had crossed over the river and gained the further shore. Then, with his heart filled with sorrow at being parted from his daughter, he turned back from the Oxus. When the good news came from Mahan Satid, people happily gathered at the court with presents, calling down blessings on the king of Persia and the emperor of China. They decorated the towns and roads of the route, and the road to Amai and Marv were resplendent with pheasant feathers. By the time the travelers reached Gorgon and Bestem, the ground had become invisible beneath the finery and the press of people. All the men, women, and children of Persia crowded the road where the Chinese idol was to pass. They ran down jewels on her from the house's upper stories, and silver coins and saffron were scattered in her way. Bowls, of sweet-smelling scents were set out, and the world re-echoed with the sound of drums and trumpets. The horses' manes were soaked in musk and wine. They trod on silver and sugar, and such was the din of flutes and harps and lutes, that there was no place where a man could be quiet and sleep. The princess was brought into the women's apartments, and Kestra looked into the litter. He saw a cypress tree, with the full moon above it, crowned by her sweet-smelling hair that fell in cunningly woven braids. Its musky ringlets framed the roses of her face, which shone as brightly as the planet Jupiter. King Kestra stared at her, and repeatedly said the name of God in his wonder at her beauty. He selected apartments that were worthy of her, and a throne was prepared in her honor. One day, when the king's audience hall was hung with Byzantine brocade, the royal crown suspended above his throne, and the room was thronged with priests and lords of the marches from Balk, Bamian, Karzabin, and crowned and seated on ivory thrones. The court learned that an envoy from an Indian king was approaching with a caravan of horsemen from Sindh, elephants shaded by parasols and a thousand laden camels. As soon as the king heard this, he sent an escort to welcome the caravan. The envoy entered the court and made his obeisance and called down God's blessings, as is the custom of noblemen, and spread many jewels before the king as an offering, as well as ten elephants, earrings, and a parasol decorated in gold with gems woven into its fabric. Then he unpacked the goods in his train and brought them all before the king. There were great quantities of gold and silver, musk, ambergris, fresh-cut aloes, wood, rubies, diadems, and glittering Indian swords. Everything that Kanaj produced was there, and the servants hurried to lay this wealth before the throne. Kesra examined the presents that the Indian Raja had labored to collect, and had them taken to his treasury. Then the envoy presented a letter written on silk to Nushin Ravine from the Indian king, together with a chessboard and its pieces made with such skill that they were worth a treasure in themselves. The Raja had written, May you reign for as long as the heavens turn. Set this chessboard and its pieces before your most learned men to see if they can understand the subtle game, the name of its pieces and where each one's home is on the board, 
see whether they can comprehend what the pawns and elephants do and what the moves of the rook, the knight, the king, and the adviser are. If their intellects can fathom this subtle game, we shall gladly send tribute and taxes that the king has demanded. But if the famous sages of Iran are all deficient in such knowledge, if their knowledge is not equal to ours, then Iran shall no longer demand tribute from us. It is we who should accept tribute from you, since knowledge is the best of all things that confer glory. Kesho listened carefully to what was said, and then he set the board before him, and he looked at the pieces. On one side they were painted of ivory, and on the other side of teak. The great king asked about the game, the pieces, and the board. The envoy answered, Your Majesty, the rules are those of war. See if you can work out the moves of the rook and the elephant, and how the pieces are drawn up for battle. The king said, Give us a week, and on the eighth day we'll be happy to play this game with you. Fine apartments were set aside for the envoy, and all his needs were taken care of. Priests and learned men came, and they poured over the chessboard and its pieces. They tried various solutions and discussed the possibilities with one another, but none of them could work out the game's rules, and frowning, they gave up the attempt. Borjimaj came to the king and saw that he was very disappointed by their remarks. But the vizier knew how to resolve the matter, and he said to Kesra, "'Your Majesty,' I shall take wisdom as my guide and solve the riddle of this subtle game. The king said, You are the man for this problem. May your soul see its way to a solution. Otherwise, the Raja of Kanuj is going to say, The king has no one who can fathom such secrets, and this will be a defeat for our priests, our wise men, and the court. Borjamaj took the chessboard and the pieces, and for a day and a night he studied them carefully, moving the pieces up to the left and the right and taking notes of their positions. Then he hurried from his apartment, and the king said, Victorious king, I have studied this board and its pieces, and by the good fortune of your majesty I now understand the game. Summon the rajah's messenger and whoever else wishes to see this, but first you must witness this because the game is exactly like a battle. Overjoyed by his words, the king said that, Borjama was a man able to solve all difficulties and favored by fortune. He summoned the Rajah's envoy and seated him appropriately, and Borjama addressed him. You are the envoy of Rajah whose face is as splendid as the sun, and may wisdom be your soul's companion. What did your master say about these chess pieces to you? The envoy replied. When I left, the Rajah said to me, Take these pieces of ivory and teak before the throne of the crowned king, and tell him to have his priests and wise men examine them. If they can extend, understand this subtle game, and play it correctly and elegantly, then as far as we're able to, we shall send the purses of gold, the slaves and the tribute they demand. But if the king and his advisers cannot understand the game, if their souls are not equal to it, then the king has no right to demand tribute from us. If he despairs of understanding the game, he will realize how fine our hearts and souls are, and he will send us the surplus wealth. Borjama brought out the chessboard and said to the assembled priests and advisers, You are wise, and your hearts are pure. Take note of what he has said and of his master's views. Then the knowledgeable vizier set out the battlefield, the king's place was in the heart of his forces. His horsemen were to his right and left, and his infantry, armed with lances, stood before him. The clever vizier was next to the king to show the way when battle was joined. As the horsemen attacked from both sides, the warlike elephants were there on the left. Infantry went ahead of the horsemen to watch the ways forward. When Borjama set out the army's ranks, the whole assembly was astonished. The Indian envoy was dumbfounded and dispirited. This man of magic was bewildered, and he brooded in his heart on what he had seen. This man has never been in India, nor has he so much as seen the game before. How did he understand its rules? The earth can't show another man of equal worth. Kestra was so pleased with Borjama that it was as if the heavens themselves were smiling on him. 
He praised his vizier at length and ordered that he be given a goblet filled with splendid jewels, a saddled horse, and a purse of gold coins. Morjama went to his own home, where he shut himself away with a board and a pair of compasses. Carefully considering the game of chess, which the Indians had sent, he cuddled his brain until he conceived of the game of nard. He had a two dice made of ivory with designs on them the color of teak. He made a board similar to a chess board and set the combatants out on each side. The two armies were distributed in eight stations, where the pieces were drawn up, ready to take the opposing city. The battlefield was divided into four sections, and there were two noble and magnanimous kings, equal in their forces, and obliged not to harm one another. At their command, the army set off from each side, ready for war. If two pieces came on a solitary piece, that piece would be lost, and its side would suffer a setback. The two kings were in the thick of the fighting, each overtaking the other in turn, and sometimes the battle was in the mountains, and sometimes in the plains. And so the two kings and armies advanced until one was defeated. When he took his game to the king and explained to him the de detail, Kessler was astonished. He thought long. He thought hard about the game, and he said, Your soul is clear and bright. Hmm. May your fortune remain young and vigorous. He ordered that 2,000 camel drivers bring their animals to the court gates, and there they were loaded with goods from Byzantium, China, Central Asia, Macron, and Persia. When they were ready to set off, the king summoned the Rajah's envoy and talked with him at length about the nature of knowledge. He wrote a letter filled with wisdom and splendor, which began with praise of God, his refuge from evil. It went on, To the king of India, the lake of Kanuj, to Sindh, your wise envoy with his elephants and parasols arrived at our court and delivered your message and the game of chess to us. We asked for time, and one of our learned men considered the matter deeply, until he discovered the game's rules. This wise man has now come to Canuge, and to your majesty, bringing with him two thousand camels laden with royal gifts. We send the game of Nard as an exchange for chess, laden with royal gifts. And we see that ours, and maybe yours, which we'll see which one is the finer game. You have many pure soul Brahmins with you. Let us see if they can understand this game. Send the goods that my messenger has taken, with such pains to bring to you to your treasury. If the Rajah of Kanuj and his advisers cannot fathom our game, he must send us an equivalent number of camel loads of goods. This is the agreement between us. The sun shining rose in the sky, and Borjamaj set off from court. As he approached the Raja's kingdom with his gifts, the letter and the came of Nard, Brahmins gladly came to guide him. His head was filled with thoughts of the coming contest. When he was admitted into the Raja's presence and saw his crown and the splendor of his court, he praised him at length in Parlavi then handed over the king's letter. He talked in detail about his journey, the game of chess, and the trouble he had taken to understand it. Then he conveyed the greetings of the king of king, and the Raja's face opened like a blossoming flower. Next, he produced the game of Nard. Pointing out the dice and its pieces and put forward the king's proposal, lastly he said that when the king's letter had been read, he was sure that the Raja would not act unjustly. The Raja's face turned pale as this talk of chess and nard. A nobleman conducted Borjama to suitable quarters. A hall was prepared for feasting, and wine and musicians were called for. The Raja asked for seven days' grace, and the country sages gathered together to examine the game of nard. For a week, the most intelligent of their men, young and old, competed against one another in trying to work out how the game of Nard was played. On the eighth day, their chief priest said to the Raja, No one can make heads or tails of this game. Wisdom will have to help our souls if we're to construct a game from these pieces. On the ninth day, Borjma came forward with a frown on his face and hope in his heart. 
He said, Kestra did not tell me to stay here for a long time. I must not disappoint my king. The young priests were discouraged by this, frowning in sorrow. They confessed their inability to fathom the gain. Borjamas sat himself down, and the sages watched him intently as he set out the game and taught them how the pieces moved, which was the commander and how the war was fought, how the troops were drawn up, and how the king gave his orders. The Raja and his country sages were astounded. All of them acclaimed Borjama and called him a priest of the pure faith. The Raja questioned him about every branch of knowledge, and he answered each question appropriately. The Raja's sages and advisers cried out, This is truly an eloquent and wise man, quite apart from the business of chess and nard. They brought two thousand camels and loaded them with Kanuja's treasures. There were aloes wood and ambergris, camphor and gold, gold cl woven cloth and jewels. All this was sent together with a year's tribute from the Raja's court to the Persian king. Then the Raja asked for a crown to be brought from his treasury, together with a robe made of cloth of gold from head to foot. And this was presented to Borjamad, praising him as he did so. He also gave him gifts to Borjamad's companions. The two thousand camels laid with tribute and presents made a caravan the like of which no man had ever led before him. And as Borjamad traveled home from Kanuj, he lifted his head up to the heavens with pride. He was happy to be carrying the Raja's letter, written on silk and Devangari script, which said, The Raja and his nobles bear witness, and not out of fear, but as their true opinion that no one has ever seen a king like Nushin Ravin, or heard from learned priests of one like him. And there is no one more knowledgeable than his vizier, whose wisdom is guarded by the heavens. We have sent a year's tribute in advance, and if it is more required, we shall send that too. We have sent all that was agreed according to our wager. When the king learned that his wise adviser had been successful and was on his way home, he was overjoyed, and he gave orders that the noblemen in the city and the army be informed so that they could go together to welcome him. Warjama made a triumphal entry into the city, like a victorious prince. And when he approached the throne, the king heartily congratulated him, embracing him and questioning him about the Raja and the difficulties he had encountered along the way. Warjama told the king about his journey and his good fortune, and then laid the Raja's letter before the throne. The scribe, Yazdajerd, was summoned, and when he read the Raja's letter, the whole company was astonished at Borjama's knowledge and good fortune. Kestra said, Thanks be to God for my wisdom and for my knowledge and of what is good. Kings bow as slaves before my crown and throne, and their hearts and souls are filled with love for me. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends. <laughs>